Rule number one, don't open the door. I need a little more up top and a little less down below. Amber alert. Oh God, something's gonna happen, something's gonna happen, something's gonna happen. In orbit of Uranus. It smells. I don't even want to talk about it. Oh no, you love me, you know you love me. Just don't let it touch the, ah, 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 ah. <laughs> You know, that's great, but give me a little more. <laughs> why, why are you shooting at me? <laughs> You can't start the car. Johnny has the keys. Hello, hello, hello. Out there in YouTube and podcast land. You have reached Johnny Has the Keys, where we talk about horror movies and science fiction films and those key elements that lift and or separate them from the average genre fare. My name is Tim. I am here with my good friend, David Horton. We've been hosting this show slash podcast for quite some time now. Mm -hmm. However, David and I go further back. We've been talking movies like this for, I won't say how many years. <laughs> and mm -hmm. uh, we just decided it was time we share our knowledge and our obsession with you. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't want to specify any in particular time-wise. So we just said, hey, let's take the whole century and divide it up by decade and maybe cover a couple uh, every season. And that's what we do. Mm -hmm. um, today, well, today is a special episode. It is. <laughs> today is our 200th episode. Wow. Yeah. 200. 200. But it's That's even good. more special because this season we're doing reduxes of some of our older shows from the first season that may have not got as much notice because we weren't on YouTube at the time. Or and, because or, they were just so minimalistically produced at the time because we were so young and new. <laughs> <laughs> because I mean, for this one, I, I did. I went back and listened to our second episode ever, which is the oh, topic we're doing. And oh boy, scary! I took notes like, "What were were we in the tube? How how who who produced this? This sounds awful." Yeah, and and, and we had no format. It was basically just us talking and and throwing out stuff, and it just oh my gosh, it was so crazy. It was so crazy. It was still unscripted like it is now. You know, we still are unscripted, but at least now right. we kind of mold a little bit around, a, a, you know, a structure, so to speak. <laughs> right. I need structure. I freak yes. out without structure. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I'm glad well, we're doing this and I'm glad fans have asked that we do do this redux. So, yeah, we'll yes. have to consider doing some more of these. So, oh, I, I, I definitely think it's going to be a thing for a few seasons anyway. <laughs> and <laughs> if, for those of you curious to what David is talking about, if you don't listen to our podcast and do watch us on YouTube, the episode he is talking about is on YouTube with a still image of just our logo. And you mm -hmm. can go back and listen to it as well. Mm -hmm. However, I think today's show will probably be a little bit better. Um we are doing the it, it's technically a redux of our very first show, but really our second show, because we didn't do a movie. Our first show, we did introductions of each other on our first mm -hmm. show. And mm -hmm. our second episode was a little ditty called John Carpenter's The Thing. Mm -hmm. Man. I. I have so much to say about this movie. That's why we're not doing genre topics. Nope, <laughs> this episode's probably going to run long. Yeah, we're reduxing. Reduxing. Yes. Reduxing. Uh, uh, I, we will keep the I same am glad structure. you picked this one. I'm really glad you picked this one to redux. Uh, because well, technically I, you did because it's science fiction. <laughs> yeah, well, true. We, we each got to pick our own, and I picked this one. It's a, it's a hybrid, but yes. Correct. Second best horror sci-fi hybrid in history ever. ever ever yeah and i mean from my opinion um this movie is in my top 10 movies 
of all time. I, I, I was going to say the exact same thing. Watching mm-hmm. it again for God knows how many times I've seen this movie. Yeah. It is no longer just the top horror sci-fi movie. It's in like my top five of all time. I mean, yeah. it is that good. It's in my top 10 of all time. It is definitely in my top five of the horror sci-fi genre, mm-hmm. of course, is number two. Um, and as a sci-fi movie, it's in my top 10. It's just so well done. Watching it again, even when did it come? 82? 82, 82. 82 was a big year. We should do a top five of that year. <laughs> well, it'll be E.T., uh, <laughs> Blade, you know, Runner, Blade Runner, Star Trek, Wrath of Khan. Yeah. I mean... Uh, poltergeist, a lot of good stuff came out yeah. in 1982. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and and unfortunate for this movie, you know, history wise, but we'll get to that when we get, get into details. But each of us have probably seen this movie a dozen times, I would think. Oh, um, more, but yeah. Uh, and and it was so uh, that's why I just wanted to start off with that because it was so good to watch it again just to see all of the elements that make a good movie a good movie. Uh, whether it's pacing, lighting, cinematography, performances, you know, acting, um, practical effects, thank God, please. Um, and, and great science fiction and great horror mixed. That's a hard thing to do. I mean, we did we did Event Horizon. We know it's hard to do horror science fiction. <laughs> well, um, and, and, and there are movies that we love that are not perfect because they may be strong in one area and have Mm -hmm. some plot holes or weak areas elsewhere. Uh I think you summed it up with what you just said. This is a perfect film. Mm -hmm. I think almost every component, if not every component is essential. And it's like a big pot of the best stew you've ever had perfectly seasoned because of the music, the direction, the cast, the special effects, everything about this movie works. And and in my opinion, it is probably Carpenter's. I, I, I kind of this time switched to, I think I said it last time on the original podcast, but I think this time it jumped up to this, I think, is Carpenter's best movie. Mm-hmm. Halloween then being his second. Um, it also was kind of the end to me of Carpenter's good movies. <laughs> he went on from there and did more, but they weren't. Yeah, it's good. You know, uh, I, was- t- I told you I have the Carpenter arc. Oh, okay. Where he did he did some good. He did a student film, a good movie, a great movie, a good movie, good movie, great movie, great movie. And then it just went dropped Whoa. like a yes. cliff, and all of a sudden he wasn't doing anything worth a damn anymore. And I yeah. wonder because you know doing some research on this and the production and the reception and everything else, I wonder if that had something to do with it. I mean, he spent so long in pre-production of this. He spent so long in trying to get exactly what he wanted, and he did it, and it bombed. Bombed terribly. And the yeah. studio felt it. The critics felt it. Everything, and that was un- totally unfortunate. And then it got resurgence and everything else. But that was. You know, a decade later, really. a lot longer. Yeah, it was. It was after it was on video, it started resurging in popularity, and I think the the uh, accolades have just grown every year since. Oh yeah. Yeah. But I wonder if that had something, you know, just mentally to do with him and his talent and his skill level and everything. About why am I investing so much anymore if that's a reception I'm going to get as something that I really love so much or really liked? Uh, because he has stated he loves this movie. He he mm. really thinks this is probably one of his best movies. So uh, I, I just it's funny because- that you said investing more because that's the way I feel about his last ten movies is that there's oh, he's yeah. phoning it in. It's just oh, yeah. not even good or so even true. trying. Yep. Yeah. So true. Uh, and, and that's unfortunate because he can do something like this that has now registered, been accepted by fans, had this huge cult following, uh, has led to a, quote, sequel slash prequel. We won't go there very much, but it was there. Um, there's a great game out that I haven't bought yet, but I want it so far. But it's a role playing game, you know, that you play like Dungeons and Dragons. And it's called Outpost 31. You've told and, me about it. And it sounds so cool. <laughs> <laughs> of of yeah you you play one of the you know one of the people at this outpost and one of you is already a thing when the game starts 
And the purpose, you know, the goal of the thing is to get as many people replicated as he can. And the goal of you is to find the thing and stop it sort of thing. Now I do, we, I will say that as we get into this, you said perfect movie. I, you know, of course I'm me. So I do have certain, uh, questionable objections to parts of this uh and i also have you know some some logic well this doesn't make sense sort of things but that's okay i overlooked those because it's really good um for uh, those of you know, who haven't it, seen I, I think i caught one too um Ooh. i'm trying to think of what it was but there are a, 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 a few slight things in this movie that where you question well why did that yeah why that yeah. well uh for those of you who haven't seen it, uh, go watch it now because we will spoil it. That's part of what we do. Um, we are unscripted on this, so we'll come and ramble too. But uh, and when we both tend to get excited about a movie, it can be long. So sit back, relax, you know, enjoy the ride, uh, kind of thing. Um, brief synopsis takes place in Antarctica at Outpost Thirty One, which is a research station. Um, it starts Number out four. with <laughs> it starts out with wonderful um, wonderful uh, exposition through conflict as we are following a helicopter that is following a dog and shooting at it. And in the first sequence, we end up uh, having the helicopter land. Uh, obviously, they're speaking some foreign language. We don't understand at first uh They're but Norwegian, then matt calls matt. them swedes <laughs> yeah um <laughs> and they're trying to kill this dog uh gary who is one of the is essentially the manager of the outpost draws his revolver shoots the uh, uh the norwegian who was shooting at them and kills him well he he accidentally shoots one of the members of the camp Bennings, the Norwegian the does. Yes, yeah, the Norwegian does, mm -hmm. and that's when Gary says, "Oh, I got to handle this," and he breaks the window out and shoots the guy that's shooting at the dog. Correct. Yeah. Uh, the other Norwegian, who was the helicopter pilot, ends up blowing up his own helicopter by accidentally dropping a grenade in the snow, uh, and so our guys, who are we have barely been introduced to here, are suddenly thrust into this mystery of what the hell is going on. Yeah, they woke up one Saturday morning and like, what the hell? <laughs> We're in uh, the middle of nowhere. How could this be happening? <laughs> how could this be happening? They find out that it's coming from a nearby Norwegian outpost. So McCready, who becomes our, you know, our essentially our hero of the piece uh, and another character uh, go there to investigate. Meanwhile, they take in this dog that they were, you know, that was being hunted by the Norwegians. When they get to the Norwegian base, they find it totally destroyed. Half of it burned down, dead bodies, uh, bodies that have died of suicide, bodies that have been dismembered, and some weird, huge kind of amalgamation of bodies. Human slash whatever. Yeah. Yes. They take that all back. Um and through the course of the next, uh, you know, 90 minutes, we find out that these Norwegians had discovered an, a spacecraft in the, in the ice. Then they also had discovered a body or some kind of remnant of the spacecraft. Uh, it thawed out and a thing from another world uh, uh -huh. has taken over. And it's able to perfectly replicate a human being. And uh, so now as in a great sequence where McCready says, so it's one of us. So one of us is that thing. And we don't know who it is and we don't know which one, but we got to find out and we can't let it get. We can't let it get to the mainland. If it gets to the mainland, all of Earth will be taken over. <clears throat> so we've got to figure it out. It's, uh, um, it's Agatha Christie with multiple killers. Very good. Great yeah. key right there. Let me tell you. Um, so it's Agatha Christie murder on the Nile. Wasn't that the one where everybody did it? <laughs> it's murder in Antarctica. <laughs> yeah, this is murder in Antarctica uh, with Hercule Poirot and a huge beard. No. Um <laughs> We usually do start by saying, when's the first time? Did you see this movie in the theater um, when it came out in 82? I saw it at a drive-in. Mm. Okay. Yeah. I, well, I saw it at a drive-in with Steve Rowey because Steve Rowey, I think, had already seen it. 
and yep. was wanting me to see it. And other friends of mine from high school were there because I think I was a senior. And I just remember Chris Derman was there with his girlfriend, Laura Parker, at the time. And Laura Parker freaked out over the dog shooting scene. And I don't know if they even made it through the rest of the movie. They may have had to leave. <laughs> oh, the after the dog attack. Well, the dog attack was bad enough, but then the the killing of the any any of the killing of the dogs, whether it be the monster or the men, um, oh, yeah. that that she just couldn't handle it. She's too big of an animal lover. So, mm -hmm. um, Understandable. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm pretty sure that was the first time I've seen it, and then I've seen it on video. I own it on DVD. I, I, you said a dozen times. I would double that. I've probably seen it more than twenty times. Yeah. Yeah. Own the Blu-ray, own the VHS, right. watch it right. over and over. I had the poster. <clears throat> so yeah. all the background, I mean, all the special features, all that stuff. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I was the same way. I saw it at a theater. Uh, uh, I have owned it, watched it over and over since then. Um, I do think that it's... It, 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 there's just so much. You can, you can start watching. This is one of those where... You know, if if you walked into the living room and it was on halfway through, you would sit down and watch it. You can oh, watch the you rest would of be it with sucked no in like yeah. instantly. Yeah, <laughs> uh, you go back and rewatch the last scene over and over again. Going really? Are all these theories you're seeing online true now? What is it? Hmm. Mm -hmm. Can I see a glint in his eye? Uh, hmm. Uh, is is child's breathing? Can I see his breath? You know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's got an earring. Oh my god. Um, <laughs> what is his earring <laughs> so production production uh, i guess you want to go there and just talk about well history, uh, either there or scenes and if we go to scenes well the one thing i wanted to mention that you neglected to mention in the synopsis yeah is there is a teaser before the credits mm. or during the credits we do see a, a spaceship yeah. it's a great teaser of a giant spaceship crashing into the earth you just don't know that it's probably millions of years ago mm -hmm. because you're in outer space you don't really see earth you see it crash into earth right. and and then it has that the way they burn it's a special effect that's actually they did really easily but it looks like the letters kind of get burned onto the screen and it's very old 1950s style <laughs> You know, the thing. John, John Carpenter's, Carpenter's thing. The yeah. thing. And why is that? They did that special effect because this is essentially a remake. It is a mm -hmm. remake of the Christian Nyby Howard Hawks version called The Thing from Another World. Correct. So this really, and that title sequence was the same way. It was that burn in of the thing as you're, mm -hmm. oh, yeah. you know. And Howard Hawks um, is one of John Carpenter's favorite directors. He said that. He's gone on record saying that. He's, he's a big Western fan. Yep. And Howard Hawks was a Western director as well as director of Thing from Another World. Well, and I think on our one of our things recently, somebody, one of our fans commented that, you know, uh, Howard Hawks didn't direct the thing Christian Nyby did. And that is up for debate in a lot of ways. As a matter of fact, even if you go to IMDb, it says two directors, Christian Nyby, Howard Hawks, and it says Howard Hawks uncredited. Um, and, you know, we have said, I think we said on the original show, this is kind of like that whole poltergeist thing. Right. With Toby Hooper and Steven Spielberg. Yeah. It and, looks like a Spielberg film, even though Toby Cooper's Toby Hooper's credited. Yeah. Um, so maybe there, there was some ghost directing going on. Correct. You know? And there's another example of this that someone commented recently on YouTube with um, this island earth. Um, mm, yeah. Because you had mentioned that it was Jack Arnold. And Jack he Arnold. said, no, it was somebody else. I can't remember who it was. And mm -hmm. we know that that somebody else was not doing so great, especially with the metal lumen scenes. And they brought yep. Jack Arnold in to fix it. To jazz it up. Yeah, so to, to, I have to, a feeling they brought Howard Hawks in to fix Christian Ivey's version of the original movie. The thing. Oh, I so agree. There's so much yeah. of that pacing wise and structure and shot look that looks like Howard Hawks. So mm -hmm. I, I definitely think that happened. Um, mm -hmm. But all of them, uh, well, supposedly that movie <laughs> and this movie and the Redux, so to speak, or the, the, the prequel are based on an original short story novella published in 1938 called yep. who goes there john w campbell and this was um from what i did in research this was not 
greatly received when it first came out. But then as sci-fi started picking up in the 40s and the 50s and the UFO, you know, the UFO uh, craze and everything else, suddenly people started discovering it. And then it became very popular because it is a great short story. If you guys have not read this story, read it. It is excellent. Yeah, it's kind of long. It's it's almost like I would consider a novella, maybe. And yes. um, there is, I was going to mention this, there is a version out there now that came out a few years back called Frozen Hell, mm. where they actually found parts of it that had been excised by Campbell and they or yeah, Campbell, and they put them back in, and now it's even longer. Oh, I haven't so, read that one. Though. Yeah, it, it's great. Um, uh, it's called Frozen Hell. There is also another book out called Short Things, which are just stories by other authors told in this universe. So mm. the book is has as much of a livelihood as the film series. It appears now. Yeah. So yep. it is growing just like the they did a sequel, prequel, whatever to this in 2011 that we will not talk about much. But Well, Think From Another World was definitely done as a 50s horror movie. Uh, it was they, they said it was an extraterrestrial. They said it was a giant vegetable, but it looked like James Arness with a weird head and some, you know, spikes going out of his fingers. I think Stephen King called him a giant rutabaga. Rutabaga, yeah, mm-hmm. and so it, and it was done like that. So it was much more of an us against it creature feature, monster man. Carpenter went much more back to the original Campbell story, which is full of masculine role models. It's full of paranoia. It has all these themes of you know of social of survival, isolation, mistrust. Uh, even though I've I've stayed with these guys for two years, are you really you right now? Kind of thing. And then how do we find out? Who do you trust? And the and- monster is very similar to the carpenter monster, where it can manipulate cells and change Correct. design and and replicate people. Yeah, and that kind. Of, so by going back to the you know the source material in such a great way. I think what he did really well was he also inspired Batine, Rob Batine, who did the makeup, that um, this thing survived for thousands of years, you know, millions in the ice here. But before that, other planets, other civilizations, everything. So let's see some things from other worlds. Right. As it it, it it changes and morphs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah. You know, and that was a brilliant idea. That was really good. Um. So, so that's kind of where it came from. I did have in production notes, and you may know more, but mm-hmm. I had my production notes that Toby Hooper was attached to this project. Uh, at it one point. is true. He was. Okay. I even know a little bit about the script. Um, okay. A- apparently, his version obviously would be drastically different because I don't think he's as good a director as Carpenter. But his featured an alien that did not shapeshift or assimilate And it followed an Ahab like character called the captain who was on like an epic obsession quest to kill it. Okay. So that was more the idea Cooper was, I mean, to Hooper was spinning and Carpenter was attached at the time to the Stephen King movie Firestarter. Mm -hmm. Um, And both were replaced. I mean, both he and, um, can't remember who there was someone else he was working with on firestarter maybe the screenplay writer anyway they both got canned and they uh when the thing came available they were like oh we're on it Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so interesting i I think it's interesting we had just talked about poltergeist being a toby hooper ghost directed by spielberg and now toby hooper's (laughs) attached to this then out uh, you know what? I take I take that back. I had that backwards. I'm sorry, people. I misspoke. Uh, what I meant was the, they were attached to Firestarter after the thing and the thing bombed. So they ended up losing that gig. And that's a oh, shame. OK, because Firestarter was a terrible. Movie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry about it. I don't know. Why what, I got out of line there. What had Carpenter come from? Uh, what was right before, before this. this? Was Probably it? Probably Escape from New York. Escape that was from around New York. 1981. Okay. And he had just worked with Carpenter on that and that Elvis movie he did for television. With Kurt Russell. 
Yes. Right. Right. But so so Carpenter was still riding pretty high after Escape from New York. So it was pretty good then for him to get attached to this. I do know in my trivia stuff, I do have that um, this is the longest pre-production he ever had for a show, for a movie. This was his first real studio movie because Escape from New York is still considered an independent film, even though I think Universal distributed it. It was still an independent film. Um, it looks and, like it has more money in it. It does. Mm -hmm. um, but but this one definitely looks like it has more money. And they definitely took the time to do things like practical effects, like film literally in Stewart, British Columbia. So you're actually on a glacier mm -hmm. shooting this, which added so much realism to this. There's a great um, documentary. You can find it online called Terror Takes Shape. And I watched it and it was excellent because it has a lot of Rob Bottin, has a lot of Dean Cundy, has a, a lot of, of Carpenter you, those himself. Those are the ingredients I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but Dean Cundy talking about they found Stuart, British Columbia, which was only like a 20 minute ride uh, in buses and everything else and trucks from the glacier. So they, Stewart had hotel rooms and yada, yada for crew and for the guys and everything else. But they went up there and they went in the summer. So there was very little snow. It was, you know, wasn't warm, of course, because it's a freaking glacier in British Columbia, but it was at least, you know, sunny kind of thing. And they built the sets. And then they, while they, continue doing pre-production and uh, work on the effects and all that kind of stuff, they waited for the snow. And that's when they all went back. And it was real snow and it's practical snow and it works. And they actually stayed there for like two weeks before they even started shooting. shooting. So these guys got to get that. You know, we've talked before about other movies with Coppola or Scorsese even, whomever who... They take time to rehearse. They take time to spend time together, to know each other, to develop these characters. There's a great part of the uh, the documentary where I think it's it's either I think it's Richard, I think it's David Masser that's saying. Um, uh, he said we got so close to each other that John's job was pretty easy <laughs> he could worry about the cameras and the lighting and everything else because we knew where we were going as a that cast sounds like monsieur and of yeah. course he was the, the which one so say that again. so i mean he obviously would would talk about acting yes yeah it's that up because upon again the other day i thought that that those guys didn't stay in hotels. They lived there. It mm -hmm. looks like that shack with the light on it. McCready probably just, you know, Kurt Russell just, <laughs> mm -hmm. I know that's not true, but it's right. <laughs> there were times when they did, you know, they stayed there overnight or whatever, but, right. I'm uh, sure. but yeah, but they had spent time together. So that, and that shows. That's mm -hmm. part of what Carpenter does really well in this is a, a establishing the characters at the beginning and B the way we see the nuances of these characters so quickly. And we're just right there with them. You know, we, Oh, Clark, he's quiet. He's going to be in the background. He loves the animals. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Knowles. He's, he likes to roller skate. He's the cook. Uh, he's kind of hanging out with Parker a lot because we get an idea that they both get stoned a lot. You know, I mean, oh, you talk about Parker and Childs. They they're the ones that are smoking dope. Well, I think Knowles probably does too. He probably, probably hangs with. Them. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah they probably all do, just about. Yeah. But um, it's funny that you said that because, and we'll get into the characters. You know, I'll talk about this when we talk about the cast because I still don't know a hundred percent what everyone's role is. I know almost all of their roles, but I mm -hmm. don't know everyone. Yep. But. Well, it's kind of, I'm the same way if I don't know, like with Fuchs, I never really knew about Fuchs. And then I said, oh, he's a scientist. He's an anybody assistant who, to Blair. Yeah. Anybody he's I like don't know, I just second. call, that's the scientist. <laughs> right. The one I don't know is Bennings. What is Bennings? Bennings, I thought was my, the mechanic. 
He was okay. the one that that took care of like the mechanical part and probably the generators and all of that. That's the impression I got from Bennings. And what is Charles? Scientist. No, I don't no, know. <laughs> no, 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 no. And that's what I'm saying. There's a couple that I really don't know what they do. And Bennings and Childs are the two main ones. Fuchs, I can say, yeah, he's an assistant to Blair in science. Yeah. And Blair was uh, Blair was obviously the 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 doctor, the scientist, the whatever. Right. Gary, Windows Gary's, is communication, which Gary's says a lot manager. about his name. And Gary is like the commander. Um, he's the yeah. only one that wears a uniform. I don't know if it's a military operation or if he just likes wearing his uniform. In the uh, script, he is called base manager. So okay. I'm assuming he's the corporate guy, right? You know, kind of thing. Uh, Norris. What did you have for Norris then? Yeah, see, I don't think I have anything for Norris either. I think Norris has to be another scientist. Uh, but what about um, Palmer then? You know, Palmer. Exactly. To me, what is Palmer? Yeah. I mean, is he just a grunt? Is he just up there to help? Is he a geologist? Maybe he's the janitor. really stoned? <laughs> he's the janitor. Uh, I don't. Uh, yeah. I mean, but uh, Copper is obviously the doctor. McCready's obviously the pilot. Blair's mm -hmm. the scientist. Um, but yeah, what's Palmer? What's Childs? What's Norris? I'm not really sure. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting is, you know, we've talked about it before, especially in slasher films, where they throw as many available bodies as they can out there. And we really don't care when they die. No. Uh, with this one, we really do. Oh, we and know we, these people. We yes. know these characters. Within mm -hmm. 15 minutes of this movie, you, you may not like, like we're having struggling with, and we've seen it, you know, two dozen times. We don't know what their roles might have been in the base, mm -hmm. but we know what their character traits are and how they care, how they interact with each other. Mm -hmm. And that's hard to do uh, because it takes not only good writing, it takes good acting, and it takes good direction to make that work. Well, and also it starts in Medius Rest. You oh, yeah. You don't know what's going on. And there's very little dialogue. It's just a little character dialogue and throwaways. If you mm -hmm. turn on the subtitles, which I know you hate doing, you'll hear shit you didn't even know was in there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you'll be like, whoa, when did he say that? <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. I mean, like, yeah. I noticed this time that Windows is playing a guitar in the background of one of the first scenes. And I was like, I don't remember seeing him play a guitar before. Yeah. That's my dog scene. That's the yeah. one where they're playing cards in the foreground. Yeah, and exactly. Pool, it's like the guitar. it's right. It's the next day or that evening after the shot. Yeah, yeah. It's and the rec room scene. Settling back in. Yeah, and the dog is just kind of moving through. He he stumbles under um, Bennings, and Bennings tells uh, Clark to put him in the kennel. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because oh, that's after. Well, another well, okay. So we were uh, yeah, I was going to uh, say uh, if we're not, done, I mean, uh, do you have it? Let me see if I have any production stuff because we can go straight to scenes. That's basically where we are. Um, I wanted to mention, and this is where I got confused with the fire starter thing. Uh, I had it under this, and I didn't realize it. But the writer is Bill Lancaster, yes. and I think he is phenomenal. But yes. he does. He has hardly any credits at all. No, nope. he did the Bad News Bears movies. Yep. I mean, and that's what he's this. known for, based on the story by John W. Campbell. He was the son of Burt Lancaster and Norma Anderson, so he had mm -hmm. some Hollywood clout. But he was going to go on and do Firestarter with Carpenter, and it would have been probably a much better movie. But this movie tanked, and they got fired. Yeah. And I, and again, going back to my thing, I don't know if that affected him you know, personally, his career. And he just yeah, said, I'm not, I'm not doing this anymore. No, because you know, he went not, on to do Christine, which is only so so. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, what he's a, obviously this show's great adaptation. Uh, it's unfortunate this movie wasn't more recognized, you know, award wise and all of that, just because mm -hmm. it was so good. Well, um, and Carpenter did not want to write this. He usually writes his stuff, mm -hmm. but he didn't want it because he was a little burnt out after doing Escape from New York and he had written the Philadelphia Experiment as well mm -hmm. and i also remember he wrote that movie eyes of laura mars i think that was much earlier but um three other people were asked um if they would write the screenplay did you know who they were no richard matheson was mm -hmm. one um, okay. he's a good choice uh nigel neal who 
from the Quatermass experiment. Quatermass. Uh, experiment. We've talked about that movie. And uh, Derek Washburn, who I'm not sure who that is, were all approached, but did not do it. And that's how- Matheson would have been good. I think Neil would have made it too much like the Nyby version. That's a very, it strikes me as a very British sort of approach, you know, all that right. wit and parry and, you know, yes, major wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Let's have yeah. the woman make more coffee. <laughs> oh <laughs> you know, my God. Yeah. Kind of thing there. to it. But I did see in the documentary, it was Carpenter's decision to not have women. He said he wanted to keep that from the novel, the novella. And also the fact that that adds to this paranoia here and takes all kind of gender issues out of it kind of thing. Um, yeah, which that way you don't have any like sexual harassment going on and that kind of right. crap. Yeah. Or any of that. Or and, and I know that, might- that women had to fight for a long time to get in movies or more, more representation in movies, but I'm glad this movie doesn't have women in it. I think this movie... I think one of the components that makes this movie is the testosterone. Oh, gosh. Yeah. The, and yeah. the misogyny, all of it, this, this, this whole masculine feel all the way through it. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and I guess the only other real production I had, I'm sure more will come up as I glanced at my notes was Rob Bottin. You know, the dude mm-hmm. was like 23. Yeah. He was young. Uh, and young, dumb and, and great uh, because he had, he had originally worked with Carpenter on the fog, just on a, a few, just for a few days. He filled in and did some makeup effects, and he actually ended up, I think, being one of the. He was one of the ghosts. The ghosts mm-hmm. in the the chapel scene, and, and I think he did this... the worm scene when the guy's face gets yeah. cut, and you see the worm in it. He did and Carpenter saw this it. young kid, thought he was really good. He went off to do the howling. Which is then has you know still has the second best werewolf transformation in history ever, right? Um, and then Carpenter hired him for this and basically gave him carte blanche. You know, do mm-hmm. what you do, dude. And it totally shows. It's amazing. I don't think these effects a still hold up from 1982, and people just don't do this technology anymore. It's sad that this that CGI has so replaced practical effects mm-hmm. and because it's cheaper. Uh, and again, yeah. Well, yeah, but it it comes out in the documentary again, I would recommend it because the cast wasn't in his workshop. A couple of them were who were there earlier and arrived earlier in, in LA for the shoot, but they, because all the, of course the effects were not done in British Columbia, all of that's done in Los Angeles, but so a lot of times when they come to the set that day and see stuff, they're seeing it for the first time and going, oh, my God, what did this guy make? And why is there, why are there five gallon buckets of of, of blood of, and slime of, <laughs> of slime over here? I didn't know anybody had that much KY jelly, you know, yeah. kind of thing. Um, so but but it works. And it's well, great. and he was he was, as you said, very young and at one point got overwhelmed. There were some times when it was affecting his health. And they did bring Stan Winston in to do that one behind me, that dog creature. He did the dog, effect, the dog puppet, the dog split. Right. And Stan Winston, that. if you guys out there don't know, is the guy that brought us basically Jurassic Park. <laughs> so he's pretty good. And Terminator. And <laughs> right. I mean, he, Stan Winston Studios is amazing too mm-hmm. uh but he said he was happy to come and help rob out because rob was suffering literally uh he said for 15 months he worked every day yeah in pre-production for the thing and yeah. so he was in the hospital with exhaustion and yeah and susceptible to illness because his defense make i mean it's uh what do you call it resistance immune to, system uh, yeah, yeah immune system mm-hmm. yeah was low well, and he was also trying stuff that had never been done before. He talks mm-hmm. about, he tells the big story in the documentary, of, and he's done it several times, I think, since then about uh, um, the scene where you're that you have where the head splits off and pops and everything else. And the fact that they threw so many yeah. chemicals in it and literally had no idea what they were using. They were, they were breathing. Just, yeah. yeah. They were breathing Ugh. it. But they, I, I will I, I, I will still go on record as to say that is the most realistic robotic head I've ever seen in a movie and still is. Yeah. The head looks real. Yeah. 
but when it stretches out and everything else and they you know carpenter wanted like a little bit of flame at the bottom of the frame because you know they've already hit the flamethrower once so we'd see that in the picture and he mm -hmm. said okay and they lit the the torch bar and the whole thing blew up <laughs> and he said we all looked like wiley e. coyote looking around and carpenter goes what the hell happened bases. and i said i don't i don't know man i don't know <laughs> that's hilarious <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, again, another sad thing. Rob Bateen hasn't done a lot since then and really hasn't been gotten given the recognition that I think he's deserved. Everybody mentions, you know, Stan Winston or Dick Smith or Rick Baker, but they don't mention Rob Bateen as much. And Rob Bateen, uh, Tom Savini. Tom Savini's worked more than Rob Bateen. So there's that. And I think it's I think that's unfortunate. Do you know the story about how Bonting got the gig as far as the the check from Universal? No. Um, apparently, Rick Baker was approached, and so was James Cameron, because Cameron had done the mat work on Escape from New York, and they were all impressed with it. Oh, yeah, um, he did that. Bonting got hired when he asked for $120,000. He was extremely nervous about asking for so much because he had never made that much money from for a movie and universal immediately hired him because Baker and Cameron asked for twice as much. Oh yeah, of course. <laughs> it makes perfect sense. Or, or more actually it says four or five times bigger. So that, I mean, he was cheap because he was young. Yep. Yeah. Young and, and hungry, that, young and hungry. And it shows it, mm -hmm. it is, it is incomparable special effects. Um, uh, hard, and like you said, almost impossible to replicate now from a development time, from a, a, a an expense standpoint, everything. Everybody would just do like they did for the prequel. Let's just do the CGI. Yeah. It'll be easier. Yeah. Um, another person that's involved with this uh, peripherally that has somehow managed to be sprinkled all over our season this year is William F. Nolan. Mm. Um, mentioned he wrote the screenplay to burn offerings, but um, he's also done a ton of other stuff, um, including stuff we've covered this season. But he did a draft of this script as well, more loyal to the short story. But when Carpenter took over the project, um, that's when everything changed and they ended up doing another screenplay. With Lancaster. But, yeah. Yeah. Nolan yeah. did a screenplay too. Uh, let's <laughs> see. You had mentioned Carpenter normally writes his stuff, but he didn't. Uh, mm -hmm. for this one he also normally scores his stuff and he didn't for this one Ennio Morricone scored this movie and it's incredible it's one of the again like as you said at the very beginning one of the standout things of this movie is the music uh, I just found out recently doing research for this that he wrote so because he also did not collaborate with Carpenter on this. He kind of just did his own thing and then handed off the files to Carpenter and said, here's your, here's your soundtrack <laughs> kind of thing. Um, so Carpenter did augment some of it in the editing process and in the final, uh, the final edit of it. But I found out that Morricone did so much music that there were like, there was like an entire half hour that they didn't use at all for the movie. And a certain guy named Quentin Tarantino, who always loves movies and really liked it, used the unused portions of the thing in Hateful Eight. So, I, and, yeah, and that's why when I and I'm going to have to go back now and watch Hateful Eight again, because I remember thinking at the time, is he reusing the thing music? He can't do that. He can't steal freaking music from another movie. But he didn't. He actually used movie that was paid for that, but was not licensed. So there you go. That's I funny. thought that was really interesting. I found that I found that out. Um, Carpenter is really good in this from a direction standpoint in the fact that he uses those fades like fade out to black, fade out to white. He does a lot of that in this and leaves us so suspenseful. You were talking about the the scene with the guitar and the dog going through and, hey, Clark, put him in the cage with all the rest of him, blah, blah, blah. Before that, we got the scene at night, that great scene just showing the base and the outpost of just we're showing different halls and different rooms and they're kind of all. It's very Halloween. Of, very Halloween, and we're yeah. kind of getting a placement of the. We're trying to 
trying to get our bearings in this. Instead outpost. of seeing where places people were killed, we're seeing places where people are going to be killed. Yeah, and things are going to happen. We're going to run down yeah. that hallway here in a day or two. But then they have that great shot of the hallway, and just at the very, very end of it, we see the dog. And he just mm -hmm. comes walking. He looks down. out the, the door. Yeah, he just comes walking down the hallway, and he walks over here, and then he goes. To, we pull back a little bit, and he goes to a door, and we kind of go in, and we see a shadow, and the shadow turns to the dog, and we fade to black. And you're thinking, what was the purpose of that scene? I don't understand. I don't understand. Did the dog? What? What? I don't understand. Blah blah. Turns out, you know, we look in retrospect. Obviously. That was the first takeover assimilation, I guess. But we don't know uh, who. When, with uh, the room in the man with the shadow. Yeah. Who we don't know. And Carpenter cast or Carpenter put someone in there that would not was not a member of the cast. So we wouldn't yes. know. He intentionally, just in case anybody yeah. would recognize a profile, he put but a I swear actor. it looks like it looks like a skinny Norris to me. I still think it's Norris. I've said yeah. it's Norris all along. That's my my big thing on it. But he's and you thinner. can find entire <laughs> you can find entire things online of people right. with all this. Who was assimilated when? What right. happened? Who I mean, was technically who? it could have been Palmer, but it it looks the head is shaped like Norris, but the body's thinner. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, I think we talked on the original while we're you know while I'm rambling on about stuff. We talked on the original about um, the fact that maybe the thing didn't know that Norris had a heart condition. You know, it just assimilated him. But since it assimilated him totally, it also assimilated the heart condition. It did. And that's why that whole sequence happens where he has the heart attack and we have to get to probably, you know, it's a good segue for us, I think, to go into scenes because that's that scene will forever be one of the best scenes. Ever yeah, I was going to say we were talking about the components that made the movie. And since you closed on Cundy's cinematography, screens is a great segue. Yeah. Um, Cundy's cinematography in this movie is is amazing and i was amazing. noticing things well first of all when i say what my favorite scene is i'm just going to say the entire movie yes <laughs> we both <laughs> would agree with that one. i've got yeah. to where i like watching the scenes that are less known because you get so much more character development in them mm -hmm. um i also love 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 that carpenter constantly cuts to people when someone addresses them and they say nothing and he just fades out. Yes. Like they'll say, what do you think Blair? And they'll just cut to Blair and it'll just fade out and there's no response. Yes. Or it'll, you know, that's just an example. He does it multiple times with other characters. Too. Great screenwriting where he either ends the scene with us asking ourselves a question mm -hmm. like the shadow, or he ends with a literal character question that gets no answer. No answer. Like, yeah. what do you think Blair? Black. He just what looks the... up and there's nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's an excellent choice. And it's mm -hmm. so key. And I so agree with you. I like, you know, and, but every line then becomes so Interesting and so important, you know. Mm -hmm. Nall saying, "And which one of you nasty men left your torn up drawers, your dirty drawers, your dirty in drawers my, in my trash can?" Uh, yeah, you know, and you're kitchen. going, "What? What? What? What does that mean?" Oh, later on, it means a lot. Well, I was going to say it's a throwaway, and no one pays attention to it until later it comes into play. Yep. Yeah, yeah, a lot. So much of that happens, but then he has the really stark lines too that work. Like, so Clark was human. So that makes you a murderer, don't it? That's mm -hmm. just so guilt-ridden. Yeah, he is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he but he was going to kill me, so fuck you. <laughs> it was self-defense. It was self-defense. It was self-defense. <laughs> um, he had a scalpel. We saw it in the, the scene prior. Um, um, scene. The, okay, go ahead. Sorry. Well, no, I was just going to say any... I mean, the, the the classic scenes, obviously, are going to be uh, the opening with the dog, the the scene you mentioned with the dog going down the hallway, the mm -hmm. scene with the dog in the kennel, 
when mm-hmm. the other dogs know that that dog is not a real dog. Um, that whole sequence. Mm-hmm. So from the time the dog comes in and just lays down and you just go, that just looks odd. The dog laying down just looks It looks odd. like it a statue. Looks, it's it just so looks still. really weird. And then the way the other dogs slowly start reacting to it and pulling away. And then the way it rips and everything that happens. Then the whole, what the hell is going? And everybody running in, the flamethrower, the whole birth knot thing opening up going. That's you when know, Childs just, finally gets the flamethrower on it. Yeah, I, I yeah. Mean, that whole sequence, you go, what the f- <laughs> What are we watching? It's perfect. And mm-hmm. it's perfectly where it's placed. Because before that, we got weird Norwegian shooting dogs. We got weird stuff happening. We got some character development, blah, blah, blah. And then we suddenly get this horror in your face, twisted, weird, crazy. I don't know what's happened. Mm-hmm. You know, and that was a great setup. Uh, and so, yeah. the way the screenplay is, it... <sighs> I, one of the reasons I, why I think it's a perfect screenplay is I know most movies aren't, but this movie feels like it's shot in order. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because it so logically progresses. Each scene logically progresses to the next scene. Mm-hmm. You know, we found yep. I mean, like the whole reason McCready discovers a way to do the blood test is because of the scene prior where Norris's head separates and runs off like a spider. He's Mm -hmm. like, oh, wait a minute. Each individual piece of this thing's trying to survive. That means blood would probably try to survive too. And that's where he gets the idea for the test. The next scene is them all tied up on the couch and he's doing the blood test. Which is one of my scenes, the whole, that whole sequence, the way it's again, Great scene. The way he misdirects and he's talking to Gary going, yeah, that's he's got Palmer's blood in the tray and he's heating the thing, but he's talking to Gary. And he's got a thing of dynamite in his arm, too, because they tried to kill him. (laughs) And but so but we're thrown off because he's addressing Gary going, yeah, we'll get to you last, Gary, because, you know, you were the only one that could have gotten to that blood. Mm -hmm. And suddenly jump scare and it's Palmer. Palmer. That's a great scene. Uh, The chest, of course, that whole chest busted scene, biting the arms off all the fat uh, is amazing. Uh, And then another one for me that will always be is the ending. The way he does after all the explosions and we're seeing that far shot again of just the fires burning everywhere. And then we suddenly dissolve to the little burned out. I mean, the little open shack area and McCready comes in and then Childs comes in. And then all of their dialogue, if you broke, I would love to just do that scene over and over again as an acting exercise, because each of them is so accusatory without being accusatory. And it's like, we don't, it's a perfect microcosm of the movie of we don't trust each other. Right. But what are we going to do? And it all evolves prior to the blood test scene with the scene with windows and Bennings moving the corpses to the storeroom. Then Bennings changes Mm -hmm. windows and them go out and they have that horrible scene where they set him on fire, Mm -hmm. which is another great scene. Uh, Yeah. And then that's when the paranoia starts. That's when he says it can be any of us. Yeah. And and then you've got the scene where him uh, first of all, I would not be, you know, they they want you in at least a a, a pair. I wouldn't want to be in anything less than three people. Because, yeah, because a, pair, a pair, you're not safe. Over. Yeah. Right. You're not safe. No. And so when he sends windows back in and tells Niles we're going to my cabin cuz I left the light I turned the light off the night before. Mhm. I would have been, if I was Niles, I'd been like I'm not going in with you by yeah. myself. <laughs> <laughs> and if supposedly Niles finds those shredded clothing with the McCready name Ooh, on it. Oh, shit, Buana. Yeah. I ain't and going. he cuts him loose out in the snow. And that's mm-hmm. when, you know, Kurt Russell has the dynamite because he has no leverage at all against these people. They're going to kill him. Mm-hmm. And so he basically has to hold a flamethrower and a dynamite dynamite bundle for a long time, <laughs> yeah. including through that blood test and through the whole transformation of Norris and the head. Yep. Because they're after him and then he finally proves himself to be safe. And that's that's a that's a great scene too. 
after Gary says, get me off this fucking couch, mm-hmm. because at least you now know who is and who isn't for a moment. Yes. Yes. And there's a as long as we are together in this room right now, we are right. all us. So now we need to figure out. And that's why I think the screenplay again is great because mm-hmm. now we as an audience are going, how's he going to break this up? Oh my God. And then when they have to do the attack or the, the destruction phase, you know, the last mm-hmm. act, yeah. they separate. And that's what leads to everything else. Yeah. Um, Cause it's him and Niles. And I mean, him and Niles. Yeah. Niles. And, yeah. and they, uh, Neither, or not not Niles, Ch- Childs. Childs. Um, and they have to um, basically freeze to death, not knowing if either one of them's the thing. Let's um, just have a drink. <laughs> there, you can look it up on YouTube and find it. Uh, there is a Stephen Colbert interview where he brings John Carpenter on. This was pretty recent. I saw and it. He, did you see it? Where he yeah. tells him, this is my favorite horror movie. Uh, I didn't see that part. I must have saw another clip. He talks about the fact that this is his favorite horror movie. He even says, uh, my kids will say, if daddy's in a bad mood, he's watching the thing because that makes him happy. Uh, And he goes, I don't know what that says about me, but hey, it is what it is. And he knows everything about it. He knows the characters. He knows, how you know, it was really great watching him interview Carpenter. But he asked him about the ending. He says, you know, all of these theories have come up where... Well, if you look, you can't, you know, McCready, you can see his breath, but you can't see Childs. And the other one about if you look back at the whole movie, everybody who is a thing has this certain, they don't, there's no glint in their eye. Dean Cundy intentionally lit them. Uh, and Carpenter rubs and goes, oh, yeah, he, Dean intentionally lit them so they wouldn't have any light in their eyes. Uh, probably not. No. <laughs> you know, but uh, he said, so are you going to tell us? I mean, the ending tell me who who is is are either one of them the thing is the thing survives one of them everything else he goes well for about 15 or 16 million i'll tell you yeah you know <laughs> he said i want you to go on my website you call me up the other day whatever he does this whole thing but anyway he says in his opinion the end of the world the 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 end of the thing is the beginning of the end of the world which means, in his opinion, one of them is the thing, and one of them does survive. Because it does kind of get to the big, my only real, I have like three big cruxes in this movie that I think are errors. One of them is, you just said every single part of this is alive, and it shows in the blood. Every molecule will run. Every little drop of blood will run to another. So let's blow them up into a billion freaking pieces? Why would I want to do that? That makes no sense. Right. This is going to be more things. Out eventually yeah, and, it's going to be more be a, things everywhere. Mm-hmm. And the other thing is, so we're just going to, we destroy everything. We destroy records. We destroy our conversations. He destroys his tape recorder. So we're just going to sit here and freeze to death. That means eventually someone's going to find us and the thing is going to come back. Yeah. So we're not. All we're doing is saving ourselves, really, or killing ourselves. We're not really saving humanity or doing anything else. That's kind of an error, I think. Don't you think? Isn't that weird? Uh, kind of. Maybe it's why he classifies this in his apocalyptic trilogy. Yeah. Yeah. That's Prince the kind of what, and Yeah. He of actually maybe. mentioned that and kind of alluded to that, that this mm-hmm. is the beginning of an apocalypse because right. there's no way. Um, the um, and, and then my only two other ones were... Who destroyed the blood? That's a question I have because he's right. Gary is the only person with a key. So Gary and destroyed Copper's the blood. Copper's the only one that ever uses it. Yeah. Right. And if Gary did destroy the blood, why did Gary destroy the blood? Because they don't really cover that. And they don't mention that one. It's not that it's, it's these, none of these are obviously. Well, I mean, the only plausible thing is what Gary says. If someone lifted the key off of me, and that means it was either Palmer or Norris. I think it would have had to have been Palmer. I don't know if Norris would have been able to. It would have had to have been Paul yeah. because Norris wouldn't, I don't think Norris's character would have, you know, even as a thing, I don't think he would have kind of thing. Um, you mentioned in the original, our original podcast, and I agree with it, but how the hell did Blair have time to build that damn spaceship? No, that's crazy. <laughs> that That is one thing about this movie that does not make a lot of sense to me. I mean, he well, could be a, I mean, I do think the monster is intelligent. And the reason I think the monster's intelligent is the dog. Yes. When you watch that dog observe them, you, you that that 
it is l- figuring out the situation and what it yeah. needs to do. And you yeah, can it's not see a dog. it in that dog's eyes. That's not a dog. That's mm. something else. It and is the smart. same thing, you know, like when uh, uh, Blair kills Gary, you know, with one of my great makeup effects I like, when he puts his fingers, fingers in mm-hmm. it, you know, and everything else, the way he's just kind of looking down the hallway while he holds him and everything, you're just going, oh, my God. Yeah. This is not Blair at all. This is Mm-mm. he's intelligent. Um, but I mean, yeah, so- it's savage when exposed and vulnerable, but it's intelligent when it's concealed. Yeah. And I think that yeah. issue, though, of the spacecraft for Blair, it was just a production design problem because, you know, they come down the tunnel, they see this whole thing. You know, it's a it looks like a you know, a mini golf cart kind of size spacecraft, but it's still round and like a saucer and ev- everything else. That's not in the novel. In the novel, it's a it's like a jet pack. He's yeah, created so it this could little, reach civilization. That to me makes more sense and more time. Just enough to get away from the glacier and back to civilization. That's all he needs to get to. A mm-hmm. few miles, you know, 100 miles or whatever. Uh, instead of this <laughs> perfectly round. It looks <laughs> like a, the miniature version of what we saw at the beginning. Right. Crashing into the earth. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And I was going, yeah. That, so that one didn't work for me. A- and then uh, my other one is just an actual error that occurred, which is... Uh, at the beginning, the dog passes a sign that says Station 4. And the, everything else in the, you know, from Windows to McCready, everybody else says Station 31. Yeah, that's why I said it at the beginning. You said yeah. 31, and I was like, also 4. Also 4, <laughs> yeah. So those are my only errors in this incredible, great, well-done movie. Yeah. I have so. some questions that kind of bother me, though. Like. Yeah. It's not, it doesn't bother me, but I feel bad that like they torch windows and I don't think he's dead. <laughs> I think he's still alive. <laughs> I mean, basically that thing had it in his mouth, him in his mouth, but he gets spit out and he's just got a bloody head because I mean, I, but I think the man is still alive when they torch him. I thought I, I, I'm pretty sure you can also see like some tendrils kind of thing when he's there all bloodied and well and his neck may be broken well yeah that's yeah. probably a but it thing. looks to be like he could have potentially been alive and unconscious and they just set him on fire <laughs> which makes you a murderer don't it which he would but, still yeah. be the thing he just might, was not fully transformed but anyway well yeah that's such pretty is, sad for windows, such windows, life windows, windows was a pretty cool character i liked him <laughs> all the way through <laughs> where were you man yeah. yeah, he's kind that, of I mean, like the the Bill Hicks of this movie. Oh it, yeah, don't you kind think of, a little? He really bit. is like the no, not Bill Hicks, Bill Paxton. Bill Paxton. It, it's it, I, you're doing it. It's, you're, it's Hudson, not Hudson. Hicks. Yeah, and Hudson. and you're doing what I always do. I always call Bill Paxton Bill Hudson by Bill accident. Hudson. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, let's put her in charge, man. <laughs> he is kind of a similar character. He's a little bit more aggressive. Um, and I know this is going to sound strange, but if you're out there listening, does anyone agree with me? He reminds me of Michael Anthony, the bass player for Van Halen. Really? Okay. <laughs> yeah. For some reason, every time I see that guy, I'm like, doesn't he play bass for Van Halen? <laughs> <laughs> the The original bass player, that is. Anyway, um, um, we could go back to scenes, but like I said, all of them. All of I them. can't think of a scene in this movie I don't like. Like I the scene love... where they open Blair, where he goes out to visit Blair, Kurt oh, Russell, yeah. and opens that little hatch, and there's a noose hanging there. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, I'm okay now. I'm ready to come back in. I want to come back in. I'm not. I'm not bad. <laughs> yeah. No, that wait, was great. wait a minute, man. Wait. No, wait, wait. Yeah, the way he does it, <laughs> it's so good. Well, the other thing, I love, I love Russell's, uh, I love McCready's recordings. Uh, I was going to say that too. You know, yeah. We're all so tired now. Nobody trusts anybody. You know, it's just so I love good. how he keeps looking at the dirty drawers that Noss brought up. Yeah. And he never the- says anything about them. He keeps and looking I al- at him. I always took that as that was the first. Who was the first? Mm-hmm. And I think that was Norris and mm-hmm. R. Palmer. And I think he's the one that dropped him in Niles's or Niles's uh, 
kitchen trash. Kitchen trash. Yeah. Yeah. That's what it was. Because evidently- he was it hiding them. Totally rips your clothes to pieces when it transforms, obviously, yeah. in some way. Um, I also thought it was very interesting, and this came up in another podcast I was listening to, where they said one of the one of the reasons is Mac is not Mac is not an anti-hero. He's not a Snake Plissken. He actually does have heroic instincts and stuff too. Mac is also after after the Doc dies with his arms chopped off and all that kind of stuff. Mac is the only one that saw the devastation at the Norwegian base. So he knows what could happen and how bad it could be. Him and, and Copper, yeah. And that's why he is so adamant about we have to stop this because right. he knows what they were doing. And that, you know, and that, that leads to that great scene. You've got it behind you. Another great scene. Yeah. Kurt Russell freezing cold with that dynamite and a flamethrower, I mean, a flare mm -hmm. going, you better back up. Just back up, man. <laughs> Yeah. And they'll all go, go ahead, hey. Chor Go ahead, Charles. Torch me. Yeah, torch me. Hey, hey, Mac, Mac, now come on, man. Yeah, those come other on. two behind Childs drop their shit immediately. Immediately, yeah. Yeah. And then Childs finally blows his out. And I was like, wow, man, they they were gonna kill him for sure. Oh yeah. <laughs> Without a doubt. Just because and then I love it because cut yeah. to the next scene and suddenly we have the setup for the couch. Yeah. And I'm going, yeah. This well, is and this I this brings me to another scene. <sighs> First of all, all of this gets in played into motion because Blair figures it out first. And then Fuchs, of course, knows because he's an assistant that yes. some bad shit's going down. Kurt Russell's character, McCready, meets Fuchs outside where Fuchs can tell him what's going on. But then a little bit later, Fuchs is doing research and the power goes out. So he lights a candle and he ends up going outside. And that's it. I mean, never, all of a sudden they come across his burned remains. We have no idea what happened to him. Correct. Another, and that I thought that was a really cool loophole because that continues the dread because, oh, so it can totally just get rid of you and you're gone. Yeah. Uh, not, not assimilate you and kind of try to blend in. It can just like eat, consume whatever in your, we see your glasses. That's all that's left of you. Right. Kind of thing, and so we could do that corpse. too. Yeah. Meanwhile, Blair is also then destroying every <laughs> means of communication or That's exit from the, from the complex. None of y'all so, know anything, anyway. <laughs> 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 Get in here, you. <laughs> yeah, he's like Mister uh, Idaho or like Western Montana guy, just in uh -huh. there. Tearing shit up and shooting things. So <laughs> he's good. hilarious. <laughs> Cast. Let's go there. We. Got I guess that. that's probably the most logical step. Yeah. Um, I have a note here. I, I just put it in here because I don't know why. But uh, apparently, Alec Baldwin claims he auditioned for multiple roles in this film before he became a big name and didn't get any. So Alec Baldwin could have been in this movie. He would have been good. Yeah, I mean, I, I can see so. him doing. You know, Alec has a he has a, a masculine tendency anyway. In all these, he movies. could have been a Palmer too. I could see him doing Palmer <laughs> <laughs> yeah. because back then he wasn't heavy; he was skinny then. So, oh yeah, because yeah. it was Hunt for Red October time, right? So yeah, he was good. Um. All right. Well, the big guy is McCready, obviously played by Kurt Russell. Um. This is one of five movies he's done with John Carpenter. Um, probably the reason why he is not in They Live, because the characters of McCready and Pliskin do kind of cross over a little bit. And I yeah. would think that it would have crossed over even further into They Live if he had done that. Um, he did Elvis on television in like 1970 something. He did Escape from New York, Big Trouble in Little China, and Escape from L.A., which was the terrible sequel to escape from new york mm -hmm. uh, many a-list re uh actors read for this role but uh nearly everyone turned it down uh, nick nolte was the top choice i could see that you could see that at this time mm -hmm. this was before the insanity 
Um, he rejected. It was also turned down by this list of people. Jeff Bridges, Tom Berenger, Christopher Walken, Scott Glenn, Roy Scheider, Chris Christopherson, Sam Shepard, Jack Thompson, Tom Atkins, and Don Johnson. <laughs> That's a lot of people. About four of those I could see do it really well. It'd be well, really interesting to see Sam Shepard. Sam Shepard in this role would have been interesting too. Mm -hmm. And Jeff yep. Bridges is a lot like Kurt Russell to me. Yep. So he can do can that low that. anger, bad guy talk, but also be the real kind of fun, yeah. you know, up. Yeah. But Chris Walken, the no. ice is going to break. No, 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 <laughs> no, no, sir. No. Uh, Chris Kasofson, I don't really, he looks like Kurt Russell, but I don't see him doing that part. Um, the screenwriter, Bill Lancaster, who mm -hmm. we mentioned, wrote the script with Harrison Ford and Clint Eastwood in mind. The same person. I see Harrison Ford. He was busy that he was in Blade Runner. Yep. Um, some of the aforementioned names showed interest. Christopherson showed interest. Shepard showed interest, and even Harrison Ford. But they all turned it down due to issues with scheduling and filming yep. in an extreme cold climate. <laughs> A lot of people didn't want to go up to British Columbia. <laughs> yep. Yep. Uh, Do you know there's only one cast member who didn't? Wilford Brimley did not go to British Columbia. Oh, he, he did. If you notice the beginning, this is nothing to look for next time you watch it, like this week. Oh. Um, <laughs> the whole opening sequence of the helicopter, he's the only character we don't see. We meet every other character, Fuchs, Niles. We oh, see I know. I was looking for them. That's but funny. But we never see Wilford Brimley. We never see Blair okay. because he didn't go to BC. Um. Producer Stuart Cohen says the only person who genuinely seemed enthusiastic about the role was a newbie named Fred Ward, who mm -hmm. I do like. Yes. Um, but Kurt Russell was hired as a last resort on recommendation from Carpenter because of their history together. Um, and that was really shortly before they started. Principal yep. uh, photography was only a week away when Russell mm -hmm. got the role. So. Um, another person suggested by Universal for McCready, mm -hmm. who they feared didn't have enough star power, was Kevin Klein. Oh, no. Yeah, I don't see that either. Uh -uh. <laughs> I think he's, I don't know. I just see him more as a comic actor. Now, I could see Klein as Windows. He would be interesting in that character. I could yeah. see him do that one. Or Fuchs, easily, mm -hmm. of course. But now, yeah, not McCready. No, 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 no. No. Um, that brings us to uh, now, I'm off of McCready now. We're going to Blair, who was played Blair. by Wilford Brimley. He's probably yeah. my favorite character. <laughs> the diabetes. Yeah. Uh, he, we know from uh, serial commercials as well as Cocoon <laughs> and the diabetes commercial, like you said. Yep. Yep. Um, do you know who the original choice was? And it makes perfect sense when you think about it. No. Donald Pleasance. Oh, yeah. With <laughs> because of his history with John Carpenter as well. He was unable to perform uh, because of a scheduling conflict. But, yeah. And that's a good thing because Wilford Brimley is so good in this movie. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like you said, even the weird inflections he takes on at times work for this. You it's know? some I'm strange like mid- Western or Western yeah. accent. I'm yeah, okay it's... now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. All of his stuff. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, TK Carter played Nalls. Um, mm -hmm. He's a comic actor and they wanted a comic actor for this part. Um, oh, I meant to say that Wilford Brimley is no longer with us. Several members of this cast are no longer with us. And yeah, unfortunately, is one of them. Um, other comic actors that read for parts in this film were Jay Leno. Mm -hmm. I know. No, I, as soon as I read it, I was like, no. No, no. Gary Shandling. No. <laughs> who I adore, but he's he terrible for this. And Charles Fleischer. Um they mm -hmm. it said it was customary for studios to seek out stand-up comics as the next potential up and comers. So Noss was played by TK Carter with that in mind. See, I didn't know him before. So I, I remembered him before. from like a sitcom, but that was it. And it yeah. was a failed sitcom. It was not a popular sitcom. 
Um, and he has gone on. Of course, he's still acting. He's still around. Um, Palmer is played by David Clennon. <laughs> he's very memorable in this movie. Uh, he's got some great lines. Um, and he's still working. He was in Gone Girl, which was a big movie a few years back. Um, he was originally cast as Bennings, though. Did you know that? No. Yeah. But he found the Palmer character more fun. So he well, I'm sure that. he did. Yeah. yeah. Chariots of the Gods, man. They practically <laughs> own South America. <laughs> uh, Child is played by Keith David. Oh, man. Wonderful actor who is still very prolific. Um, he was actually a villain in the Disney movie, The Princess and the Frog. He plays Dr. Facilier. Um, he's in They Live, obviously, um, mm. another Carpenter movie, as well as Armageddon. Um, the role as Childs was his first credited feature film role. Wow. What yeah. a debut. Yeah. Man. Launched a, a career that's been going on for 30 something years now. Um, really good. Other people considered for Childs were Bernie Casey, Isaac Hayes, mm. who I could see. I could see. Uh, Jeffrey Holder, Ernie Hudson. I don't see doing a bad guy. Well, I mean, Childs is not bad, but he's threatening. And Ernie Hudson's not threatening to me. Ernie Hudson's is not as aggressive, I think, as um, as Keith David. But I think he could be threatening. Mm -hmm. I think he can be in your face kind of the way Childs is. I just think um, of him as the good cop and the crow. <laughs> You know, or in <laughs> Ghostbusters, you know, I just don't think of him as in that way. Tell him about the Twinkie. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Hudson almost landed the role, but lost it to Keith David. So he was considered. Yeah. Um, and of course, like I said, he's still with us. Richard Dysart died in 2015. He played yeah. Copper, the doctor. Mm -hmm. uh, we know him from a slew of successful television shows and movies, including Being There, Wall Street, and L.A. Law, which is what, what I knew him from. LA such Law. a great actor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. He's, uh, I don't know if I have a picture of him. I don't think I do. Um William Daniels and Brian Dennehy were considered for this role as well. Oh, easily could see either one of them okay. in that role. Yeah. I could see Dennehy. I'm not sure who William Daniels is. Who is William Daniels? You would recognize him. Um, okay. Black character hair. Actor. Yeah, character actor. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of character actors in this movie. Um, Good. Den Dennehy was almost cast, but Carpenter instead cast Dysart last minute. Mm -hmm. So he was fluctuating. I could I guess. see Brian Dennehy playing Clark too. I could see in a heartbeat. Yeah. yeah, he looks like a Clark, and Clark should be big and kind of menacing. Well, and Dennehy yeah. had just come off of First Blood, right? Wasn't that in eighty? It was. It was around that time. Yeah. Yeah. So he had just, you know, he and and he was great in that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it would have been good for him, and he could have gotten to be with Wilford Brimley before Cocoon. <laughs> that's right i forgot he's in that he's an alien <laughs> yeah that's right that's right i haven't seen that movie since since it came out yeah honestly um charles hallahan played vance norris um he was in dante's peak fatal beauty the fan he died tragically young in 1997 yeah. of a heart attack yeah he was only like 54 when he died mm-hmm um, George Bennings was played by Peter Maloney. He is still working. He does lots of television stuff. Um, Clark was played by Richard Masseur, who served, mm -hmm. as I said, two years as the president of Screen Actors Guild. I thought it was longer than that. He has several credits, but I think most people remember him from One Day at a Time. One Day at a Time. Yeah. That, that was his. Yeah. Um, he turned down a role in the movie E.T., to play Clark. Wow. <laughs> so he turned down Spielberg to do a John Carpenter film. Wow. That's great. Yeah, that is great. But it speaks to him as an actor. It was probably a better part. I'm sure this was. Yeah. More, yeah. And like I said, when you watch that documentary, he he approaches everything from the actor's point of view, like what it was like to do this and how how they interpreted this scene and, mm -hmm. you know, that sort of thing. So very actor's actor kind of thing which is what he is he's done a lot of theater too yeah 
Oh, yeah. And one of my favorites that is going to be little known to most folks is uh, Donald Moffat played Gary, Lieutenant Gary or, or Commander Gary, whatever his name is, yep. the, the manager of this, the station. Um, he died in 2018. He was in The Right Stuff. Mm -hmm. which you would know him from. Oh, yeah. I know him from Tales of the City, where he played Edgar Halcyon. It's a very iconic character from a series of books that were written by Armstead Maupin, one of my favorite authors. Mm -hmm. um, other people were considered for the role. One, you, two, actually, you will know make perfect sense because of the time. Um, okay. One was Lee Van Cleef. And the other was Isaac Hayes because they had both just done Escape from New York. Escape from New York. Which yeah, we covered last season. Um, yeah, we need a heavy. So yeah. bring bring in the big guy. Lee Van Cleef would have been good. Yeah. But he but would it's have it's definitely... hard to see him be doubtful. I think um the uh, Donald Moffat brought more softness to the character more vulnerability oh yeah lee van yeah. cleef would have treated him like a westerns uh a, sheriff. a bad guy yeah, yeah yeah i don't know and and i think we got the impression that gary was the manager but not the best at it or at least thought he wasn't the best at it because he gives in to mccready a lot mm -hmm. and he gives in to other heroics around there um it's like he's a leader that doesn't want to lead. That's almost why I, I kind of get that corporate sort of feel from him. He was hired to be the manager of this place. Well, all you got to do is oversee and do the weekly reports, dude. Yeah, but okay, now he's cool. all of a sudden in charge because there's a dangerous situation. Yeah, yeah. and I wasn't ever meant to do that. I didn't I sign up for this. <laughs> yeah, I didn't sign up for this, dude. Yeah. Um, do you want to know who his competition was? Because there were other people up for the role. Well, you just said... Lee Van Cleef, right? Uh, no, those were the two that were originally considered because of their relationship oh, okay. with Carpenter. Four so others were considered or, or, or were actually up for the role. Uh -huh. And one of them was Jerry Orbach. Yeah, I could see that. Kevin Conway. Couldn't see that. Not as no. Gary. No. Palmer. Uh, this is going to this give this one an open mind. Uh -huh. Richard Mulligan. They kind of favor each other. Yeah. But he he's a comic actor. But so is T, you know, TK Carter. Right. Uh, but I mean, TK Carter got the more comic role. This role is not a comic role. It's just kind of interesting that they were considering Richard Mulligan. I just think that. And the lastly, Powers Booth. Wow. I mean, yeah. And Powers can play both menacing and not menacing. So Powers could, could do anything. In yeah. this, I, I, you could even see Powers if they wanted to, you know, cross racial it. You could see him as Child, or or I could see him as Palmer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I mean, he's just that good. Um, oh, yeah. And then lastly, some of the other smaller characters. Fuchs was played by Joel Polis. He's still working mostly television. Windows was played by Thomas Waits. He's still working, and then uncredited is the voice of the chess computer which was uh carpenter's wife at the time adrian barbo oh i didn't know that that's some good trivia i did yeah, not know yeah. that was her yeah she's the cheating bitch according cheating to cheating bitch um <laughs> to according to mccready um i mean I, and and going back and listening to uh, while you're there just for sure, a second no on the computer um Going back and listening to our original, I went off on the fact that that didn't make sense. You know, you're up here stranded forever. Why would A, you waste your good scotch and B, destroy your only pastime? It makes no sense. Kind it's of thing, a... which doesn't make any sense. But it does when you look at it later on, thinking about it now. And this last time I watched it last week, when you think about McCready, it kind of sets up McCready's character. He'll do whatever it takes to to uh, you know it, he doesn't think of the consequences sometimes it's impulsive. he just he just impulsively reacts right and that's I why he that blows was, up the camp at the end right yeah. and this is our only excuse this is the only way this is what we have to do oh yeah, i'm going to okay. tie everybody to a couch and i'm going to take your blood and i'm going to test it because that's that we have to mm -hmm. you know we've got to do this and, and so he's very impulsive and it kind of sets that up but also with the wit you know stupid cheating bitch or whatever you know? The, uh, the very first scene, our, yeah. our very first introduction to him. Yeah, yeah it's his intro. 
Um, awards. This movie, as we said, was notoriously trashed when it came out because people thought it was too gory and they didn't understand it. Um, it got two nominations from the Academy of Science Fiction, Fantasy, and Horror. Um, best Horror Film, Best Special Effects. It was nominated for Jupiter Awards for Best International Film. Uh, it was nominated for a Razzie for Score, a Neo Marconi. That's insane to me. I mean, we we owned this soundtrack. We oh, played yeah. this music. This music is great. It yep. is a Neo Morcone trying to sound like John Carpenter, but it's better. Well, he's using electronic instrumentation rather than his usual yeah. uh, Western kind of, 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 of orchestration that he used. Right. And then that brings into the what you were saying about Quentin Tarantino using parts of it that were not used in mm -hmm. The Hateful Eight, which won him an Oscar. So <laughs> there you go. Um, it is on the 1001 movies you must see before you die list. As, it should, should, be. as I, it should be. I mean, back in the day, it probably wouldn't have been. But now, as you said, it has risen in stature from the failure that it was at the time. Oh, yeah. It definitely got a fan following. It definitely got a cult following. Uh, and, but not just because, oh, I liked this eclectic performance or, oh, I liked this one thing of it. It's gotten this huge following because of all of these elements working together. Mm -hmm. uh, Dean Kundi, we have always talked about, is one of the best cinematographers ever in history. Uh, his partnering with Carpenter seems to work so well. Um, and they did a, several movies together. I mean, they there did was a Halloween lot of yeah. and the fog and stuff before this because Cundy wasn't as big back then. Now he works for Spielberg. Yeah, uh, there yeah. was a lot of 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 pushback from Rob Bottin because he was so young and this was his first big movie, and he was saying, "Oh, you're not lighting my my puppets correctly. You're not lighting my makeup correctly." Blah blah blah. And Cundy was like, "Trust me." It'll be fine. We'll make it work. Mm -hmm. uh, and the in darker this it is, the better. In this uh, uh, this documentary, he has a great thing where he talks about that, about using shadow and light and side lighting. So he's playing up the contours of what Rob has created, which makes it, but we're not seeing everything in this hugely bright light, which makes it scarier. Mm -hmm. And he said that was kind of John's approach, too, to everything. He wanted shadow in the background and he wanted darkness and he wanted that dead space so that things could be back there and he talked about the scene with you know fuchs in the foreground and suddenly in the hallway back there we see the shadow go you know which is a jump scare mm -hmm. but it also works because of the music he does yeah. like a, a blast a of sound he does a, there he does a stinger there mm -hmm. yeah so um you know you were talking about well i was talking about um watching lesser scenes to pick up on things uh -huh. you don't pick up on. I never noticed until this last viewing that right before, I think it's before Blair does the autopsy when they have it on the gurney. I never saw the feet and there's like a big bird, like skeletal foot. Yeah. Like a talony looking. I have thing. never seen that before. <laughs> there's like a regular foot and then like this weird bird, like, three fingered thing uh-huh yeah well, bony well i kind of remembered that one after i saw the prequel too because they recreate that whole creature for the mm -hmm. prequel uh in cgi supposedly yeah yeah mm -hmm. that that movie's full of cgi um did you have any other trivia before you want to move on to keys it could be uh it cost 15 million dollars uh we didn't mention uh albert whitlock uh who was Hitchcock's oh yeah he's another biggie Matt artist and he uh he did all the mats for this all these incredible mats of the uh the uh um the snow the ufo uh some of the stuff in british columbia with uh, the the outpost itself kind of thing adding the mountains in the back and some of that was great um you had mentioned in our original the whole story of why mccready has to wear that hat <laughs> I forgot, but I was laughing at that hat. 
It's, it's like some uh, characteristic or caricature of like a Mexican bandito or something. Yeah, it's, Sancho it's, Panza. Sancho yeah. Panza is what it's from. From uh, uh, yeah, uh, but uh, he the got reason, set up. Yes, yeah. they did the second unit photography because Kurt, like you said, was hired very late. Principal right. photography was starting in like a week. Well, while he was getting prepped and doing it, they were shooting second unit stuff, which was all the stuff that Albert Whitlock had to do the paintings for. Right. So it was all of them uh, at the Norwegian base finding the, the flying saucer first. The saucer and then, crater. And yeah. then finding the, the, the square that had been cut out where they found the survivor kind of, or the body uh, kind of thing. Well, <laughs> the stunt actor in that scene wore that hat. Wore that hat, yes. So Kurt Russell shows up for his shoot in British Columbia, and John Carpenter hands him the hat and said, "Here, yeah." He goes, "What the hell is this?" He goes, "You're wearing it. Why? This because is your hat. They already <laughs> wore it already, so I can't change it." <laughs> yeah, I think that's hilarious. <laughs> so he just, you know, made the best of it. It worked, right? You know, but it's a cool little trivia piece. Yeah, um, um, we mentioned early on that 1982 was a big year for movies. Um, mm -hmm. One of the reasons, not the reason, but one of the reasons why this movie was shunned or did not do well is because E.T. had been released a couple of weeks earlier. Yep. Then The Thing and Blade Runner came out on the same day, yep. and both those movies did not do well because... Nope. They were darker visions of a future or a sci-fi, a darker sci-fi movie, I guess you'd say. Yep. And people were into E.T. They wanted their happy aliens. So Yeah, it was a very big juxtaposition societally, socially, everything in, in publi publicity uh, with uh, happy, sweet, nice alien, evil, mean, awful alien. And people obviously wanted more of the nice alien in their household kind of thing, mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately. But it, it yeah. is glad that they eventually got to to appreciate both of those films because Blade Runner made such a – both of them have made a huge impression in their industries. I think, I think the thing much more so for horror – and horror pacing and storytelling and that sort of use of character and Blade Runner, of course, for production design and mm -hmm. overall story arc and that sort of influence that they've had. So talking about keys, oh my God, two huge keys in what they ended up doing uh, since right. then. Um, my last two trivias are one, the name of the dog is Jed. I didn't know that in my trivia. Oh, and he is half wolf. That's why he looks a little bit bigger than the other dogs. And that's why he has such an incredible husky look to him because he's part wolf. Uh, and he was a, evidently a great dog to work with. Richard Masser talks about how he actually befriended Jed and hung out with him as Clark. He wanted to. So he right. would actually go when they were all doing dinners and stuff like that. He would take his food and go eat with the dogs. Richard Masser would. To, I mean, talk about method. But he wanted to, to he wanted to make sure that they all knew him, that he was friends, that any scene he had with the dog was great. So it worked, sort yeah. of thing. Um, um, go ahead. Another uh, underlying uh, subtext to yeah. the paranoia and fear in this movie is that it also came out right at the beginning of the AIDS crisis when people didn't know how you could get it or that it was only transmitted through blood. I can't remember exactly where we were in 1982 with those, with the research, but it was just the fear of the unknown and, and whether or not a person was infected. Yeah. So there was a lot of that going on too. It's unfortunate in retrospect, but at the time everybody was terrified. Um, and I think that's a subtext all the way through this. Yeah. You know, that's why, again, I think it should have a resurgence now post pandemic of, you know, how, how isolating and horrifying isolation can be and paranoia and mm -hmm. leading. Oh, you're, to you're using the pandemic. I was talking about AIDS, but yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Same I thing. I mean, yeah, I, I, same I, thing. And Carpenter has mentioned that AIDS was AIDS and STDs in general was right. an underlying thematic to this. Um, my last trivia is we didn't mention Mike Plug. So Mike Plug was a comic book artist that was on staff at Universal. And when 
Rob Bottin first came to John and said, hey, I read the source material and I read Campbell's novel, I mean, novella. And, you know, it seems like this thing is like tens of thousands of years old and has been on other planets and everything else. And I think it might be cool. And he had drawn a couple of just rough sketches of something he thought of what would be cool. One of those being the whole eyes on the end of stalks kind of thing. And Carpenter mm -hmm. said, okay, go, why don't you go down to the art wing, I guess, whatever, at Universal, <laughs> and meet with Mike Plug and you guys. And so they met for like three days and came back with like hundreds of, of drawings, drawings yeah. that were the inspiration for. And Carpenter would say this to this, no to that, do more of this, uh, whatever. So, But Mike Plug is like uncredited. I didn't even see him in the credits for this at all. Uh, but he was influential he in the design elements. Yeah. 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 Creative consultant, art, you know, whatever. Yeah. I have one other little trivia thing. Um, I may just read this. So to be, uh, famed, famed film critics, Siskel and Ebert huh. split on this movie. Mm -hmm. Ebert called it a barf bag movie and said it was inferior to other earlier genre entries like Alien. Uh -huh. While Gene Siskel praised the atmosphere of fear and paranoia the film effectively generates and said, yep. that's what makes the movie work, not the effects. It was rare for Siskel to praise an intense thriller like this and for Ebert to slam it. Usually it was the other way around. Yes. Yeah. Yes. They were split on this. And and you can find their reviews um, online, too, on YouTube. Uh, and it's it's sad what they say. Uh, I mean, <laughs> well, yeah, I don't always agree with them. I mean, uh, uh, for you folks out there that are younger, I mean, these guys were critics for the Chicago Sun Times for a long time, and they actually had their own show on PBS called At the Movies. And I'm mm -hmm. sure I probably saw them talk about this movie on that. Oh, show. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, and they were they were at the height of criticism, film criticism at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was unfortunate. They, yes, they did split. They're usually the opposite. Um, Ebert is usually the one that is much more interested in genre pieces. Siskel is much more interested in uh, classic drama and so, comedy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, well. There you go. Critics. Critics. <laughs> People giving their opinions about movies. How Who terrible. Do that? Who I would ever imagine. do that? Or, or have like yeah. a YouTube show even. What? <laughs> Even and not only that, a redux of doing it. Oh, yeah, twice, <laughs> twice. Um, who goes there? That's my well, first we always key. okay. That's your first key, it's got to be. <laughs> yep, uh, which is mine too, of course. I also have uh, the, the obvious invasion of the body snatchers is such a, 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 a key pre this and post this because they also did the well, no. Wasn't the remake in the 70s? 78. Yeah. Uh, so the, both the of original the, was like 56, maybe. 56, I think. I I think. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, but both that feeling of mistrust, the feeling of pod people taking over, it actually, one of the keys is pod people, that term, because that term became such a, a cliche for uh, any kind of assimilation sort of, of technique. Um, cloning all of that mm -hmm. um another one i have from the 50s is i married a monster from outer space we've already covered that but it's the same kind of thing they take over these bodies and replicate them and all the people in town suddenly aren't the people you thought they were they're really aliens in those bodies now that was more of a benign, which one is that uh, i married a monster from outer i space. married a monster okay gotcha uh there's more of a benign reason for that one. He actually just wants to repair his freaking spaceship and get away. That's all they want to do. But uh, instead, they're defeated by, you know, the evil earthlings at the end of it uh, sort of thing. That's all Blair wanted to do. That's, I, I just want to come inside. <laughs> I just want to That's come all. inside. Let me build a spaceship. Um, back to what door. I said earlier, uh, who goes there? The original novella. That is the name of the original novella. I want to beat that into people's heads in case they want to find it. Please. Um, the one I mentioned is called Frozen Hell, and that's the original novella with the excised chapters that Campbell took out of mm -hmm. it. I don't even know that he took them out. They may have been taken out by somebody else. I used to have to do some research. It's been a while since I read it up. I read about all this back the first time we did this, so it's been a while. Mm-hmm. 
Um, but other movies, um, I've got have- The Exorcist. Ooh, because why? of the chilled sets where you can see people's breath. Makes sense. Yes. Very um, true. That was the first movie I ever know, knew that did that. And they definitely mm-hmm. do that in this to give to bring about realism. Because back then they didn't have CGI to do it. Nope. And it matches so. the exteriors they shot in BC too. All the night mm-hmm. shots and all the stuff they did in British Columbia. Um, I have Alien, but not for the typical... Because Alien is probably the best science fiction horror hybrid ever made. But not just for that. I have it for the scene with Blair in the computer when he's slowly realizing, and we're kind of realizing with him, the implications of what this is. It looks like Pong. And yeah, it's a cheap little computer, (laughs) but it's the whole, you know, uh, and if the... If the entity gets away, how long? 57,000 hours until assimilation of entire population of Earth. You know, that sort of thing. It's almost like that realization of Ripley when she's finally communicating to Mother and Mother tells her the orders and the fact that, oh, no, you were sent here on purpose and uh, all the rest of the crew is expendable. It doesn't matter. And suddenly you see Ash sit up beside her kind of thing. That was just a really, yeah, that just reminded me of that kind of. The computer telling you the bad news <laughs> kind yeah, of key. For sure. Um, um, I have the X Files episode, obviously, Ice. Oh, Ice. Yeah. 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 From the very first season of the X Files, they do sort of an homage to this where oh, they are huge. In a, yeah. It, I can't remember who the other two actors are. One of them's the woman from Desperate Housewives, I think. Okay. Uh, I, I can't do, remember that. I the do remember cast, that because we covered this on a, on a Patreon thing, but it's been a while. <laughs> yeah, and the the I always remember the helicopter pilot and it got killed first. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, so they couldn't get out, and yeah. it's um instead of a a creature like the thing, it's um a worm. It's a parasite. Gets in. Yeah, it's a parasite. Ooh, mm-hmm. yeah, creepy, creepy freaking episode. Yeah, it's a good episode. <laughs> and and it's, it's got the same paranoia as this one because they end up locking Mulder up and, and Scully and Mulder have that huge confrontation where she doesn't trust him and she's got a gun on him mm-hmm. and stuff because he could be the thing, basically. So yep. that's a huge key. Uh, I've got Lovecraft, of course, and your pictures behind you are a pretty good impression of that. Yeah. That whole Lovecraftian horror design, but also Lovecraft Mountains of Madness, where they go and they find the, the you know, the ancient old one civilization buried in the ice. And it's, yeah, it's up in Antarctica or, or wherever. Yeah. It's actually North Pole, I think. Uh, is the it? Mountains of Madness is. I don't think it's Antarctica. You might be right. Uh, uh, so I have those two. Um, I have. I have the sequel uh well first i have the original thing from another world yep. in 1951 mm-hmm. and then the prequel they did in 2011 um i favor the old 1950s version the the prequel that came out in 2011 has some cool ideas because you're basically going to the norwegian camp before this happened and but it's it's just not Which- the same which would have been fine if they had told a different story. But basically, they told the same story as the thing. Mm-hmm. And that was the issue of it. Uh, it also had some issues of, like, you know, America always coming to the rescue kind of thing because the woman's an American scientist there to help them. It's um, so that they didn't have to always speak Norwegian. Yeah. yeah. I did find out in researching that the effects team that was assembled for that actually did practical effects for that entire movie and then in pre-production in post-production universal cut it all and added cgi instead which is terrible it is awful it does not work it's really bad um but then i found out that the guys i guess because of license uh, however their arrangement or contract work they ended up taking a lot of the effects and making another movie a few years later called Harbinger Down. And I've got to look it up because I haven't seen it yet. I want to see that. (laughs) And it's using the original effects from the thing prequel in this movie. And it's about, uh, it sounds very X-Files-y. You kind of uh, transitioned well um, because it's like a, 
it's like a fishing freighter or a fishing trawler or whatever, and they end up uh, retrieving a Russian spacecraft that has an alien entity aboard it that starts assimilating and taking over the crew. And so it's very Thing-esque, um, but I want to see it just for the effects. Oh, so, yeah. Interesting. Um, Lovecraft, um, Lovecraft. I have Alien as well, mm -hmm. but for a different reason. Ooh. Um, Carpenter said he set out to make this movie and the thing unique because he didn't want another man in a suit. And he said alien to him was obviously a man in a suit. Yeah, he said even, uh, I think the interview, he says, uh, no matter, even though it's so well filmed and so well shot, by the end of it, it's still a guy in the suit. Yeah. And he didn't want that. Yeah, and yeah. I think that's great. That's, that's a yeah. great point. That's why I would pick this movie over Alien. The um you mentioned the aids virus being a key to this as far as it was uh, hugely influential at the time uh and obviously well Lancaster. i don't know that it was a key so much as that the underlying paranoia was emphasized by it but i think and vice versa lancaster has mentioned that it was part of it this virus that is unknown and you don't know who you can sleep mm -hmm. with or be with uh you know anymore kind of thing um other movies that I have listed are the ones that are always dealing with alien replication. Uh, the first one was The Hidden. Do you remember that one with yeah, uh, Kyle McLaughlin? It's on our list, actually. Kyle McLaughlin and Christina, uh, Claudia Christensen. Uh, the Faculty. That's another one where they're taking over the, all the teachers and the kids start to see it and they realize it. Um, we've already done Stepford Wives, uh, but it's that, that's not alien. But that is suddenly people that were your neighbors or your friends or your spouses aren't themselves anymore. They've been replaced by replicants, essentially. Mm -hmm. uh, and one that came out a few years ago, do not watch it. It is so YA that you'll want to just claw your own eyes out. Uh, but it's called The Host. And it's the same thing. It deals with a post-assimilation period where the few surviving real humans are like refugees. They're the rebellion kind of thing. And most of the planet has been taken over by. What is it called? It's called The Host. The Host is that Korean movie that we covered. So it's not that one. It's a YA new movie that was based on a YA series of novels. Oh. And. Because, I mean, there's another movie called Host that's like a horror movie. I think um, it, it stars like Shalane Woodley or somebody like that <clears throat> is in it. And, yeah, they're they're uh, the last remnant survivors of an alien invasion where they replicate humans. I don't. I don't. I've never heard of this. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Uh, also have uh, one from television, The Invaders from the 60s. Do you remember The Invaders? I do. And they were uh, hidden too. You didn't know who they were. Correct. You had to, you, they had to, re, they had to recharge every few days or whatever. And, but you didn't, you know, he was the only one that knew that aliens were among us. Kind of thing. Well, I've got one that would go with that. And that's V that, that v? series that was yep. on in the eighties, I believe with uh, Where they Robert ate gerbils and stuff. <laughs> they, uh, they were lizards. But they look like lizards under their skin. Yeah, they had like masks on. They yeah. weren't replicated, but but again, aliens among us. It was which, not no one knew who 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 was what. Yeah, right. Yeah, which leads to one of mine from just recently. There was a huge game, really really popular. As a matter of fact, this past Halloween, I saw like a dozen of the costumes called Among Us, and it's set on a space station. And you play it with other people online. So it's a multiplayer game. But each game session, one of you is the killer, the alien. You look like everybody else, but you're an alien. And you've got to slowly kill off every other member and or they have to guess who the alien is. It's Clue. Yes. It's <laughs> Clue with aliens. Yes, it is. Strange. Um, um, I have one that I copped from IMDb. Uh, the sound mm -hmm. by the spider head is a stock effect from the Universal Library that was heard in Tarantula in 1955. Nice. 
and Deadly Mantis in 1957. Yes! One of the best ever. <laughs> We've covered one, and we'll definitely cover the other. Both films featured Kurt Russell's father, Bing Russell, in small roles and are her personal favorites of John Carpenter. So wow. Kurt Russell's dad is in both those movies. Did not know that at all. That's kind of cool. I think we knew it about Mantas, but obviously we haven't done Tarantula yet. Right. I think I mentioned it with uh, Mantis, though, maybe during casting. Um, You had mentioned Clue, which is kind of interesting to one I have. T- and you had said earlier, it's Agatha Christie, uh, Ten Little Indians. Mm-hmm. This is very Ten Little Indians because they each get bumped off sort of, you know, one at a time. I mean, it's, it's not that that's unique. And then there were none. It's called a bunch of different things. Yeah. Yeah. But and that same kind of thing has been used in you know slasher movies and everything since or before even, but it is an an element of this of yeah. slowly we're it? being pared down till the last two and then at the end who are, who's going to be the winner, right? Um, and he leaves it so open ended. Uh, did you know trivia wise? Did you know that he actually filmed a scene where uh, McCready survives? No. Yeah, I can't find it anywhere, but it was in two different interviews, so it was definitely done. And it's a it takes place like months later, and it's McCready doing a final little recording back in Civilization Alaska. somewhere <laughs> about you know uh, about the last few hours and everything else and surviving and a good thing that we did it. But it's because Universal insisted when Carpenter turned in the print with this ending that we have right now. They said, no, it's too dark. You're going to have to give the audience hope at the end, blah, 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 yada, yada. So he said, sure, right. And so they filmed it. And then he goes, and I cut it like within like a day. I cut that whole scene out. So if it, I was it, Carpenter and I filmed that scene, I would have had Kurt wear contact lenses with like a cat eye slit in one <laughs> so that they could pan up to his eye at the very end and you see it. And then it changed to a pupil. Yeah, just blink and it's a pupil. Yeah, yeah that would have been. <laughs> well, and and in the interview that I saw, uh, Carpenter said because he was really adamant, especially in 82, that he wanted to make a comment on what he called mutually assured destruction, which was also what Reagan was preaching about at the time between mm. the United States and Russia. And he said, and that's what Childs and McCready are doing at the end. They're both looking at each other going, you can't win, I can't win. Right. So I guess we both die. And he said that's what the world was going into in the 80s. And I went, ooh, yeah, wow. Yeah, he was not a Reagan fan. It's oh, obvious, no. and they lived, too. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. Yeah. Um, I have one more that I lifted from IMDb that I will read because you would know more about this than me. But Okay. Um, a diopter split focus lens was used in several shots of the mm-hmm. scene with McCready and Fuchs in the lab. McCready mm-hmm. standing in the doorway in the background and Fuchs is sitting at the desk in the foreground and both are in sharp focus. This would be impossible to do in camera without a split focus lens. Brian De Palma often used this technique in his mm-hmm. films. I was just about to mention, you know who used it all the time? Brian De Palma. Brian he De loves Palma, split focus. So that's kind of a key because Brian De Palma was constantly using split screens. And I wanted to bring that up. Well, in the that's first it. use of it, I'm pretty sure, double check me out there if I'm wrong, everybody, but I'm pretty sure the first use of that was Hitchcock. He used it in Frenzy. He used oh, uh, split that focus. makes sense. Uh, he was the first person to use a split focus. Well, and Brian De Palma worshipped at the oh altar my God. of Alfred Hitchcock. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. I mean, we've covered a couple of Brian De Palma movies, and and both of them use that split screen effect to good effect, actually. Um, um, That is all I have. I mean, there's the obvious ones, obviously. Any split. You know, flying saucer movies or assimilation movies. You have been assimilated. You are a Borg in the next generation, whatever. Um, um, I've got, I've got just two small ones and then a quote. But sure. one is, uh, one is, uh, it, this is also a very influential or a key to this would be like Philip K. Dick. That whole thing of monsters from inside us, our perception is wrong. What we think is real isn't. What who we think we trust, we don't. That whole paranoia that was, it's like in all of his stories. Okay. 
Uh, I think that's a good one for this. There was also another movie uh, came out just a few years ago um, called Life. Oh, yeah. I remember that. Um, Jake Gyllenhaal. Yeah. It's not so much an assimilation, but it's an alien slowly killing all of us. Yeah. It's, and I would say it's more of it's, a key to it's, alien. It's more of an but, alien yeah. mm-hmm. key than a, than a, this key. But again, it's a, a, a science It's also fiction. on the ship. It's not on a planet. Isn't it? Correct. You're on the space yeah. station. You're on the ISS, essentially. Mm-hmm. And then a quote. And this is actually from Lancaster, I believe. It's not in my notes, but I'm pretty sure it is. Um, who was talking about the screenplay and writing it. And he said, one of the things he enjoyed about writing this story for the screen was the alien starts acting more human and the humans start acting more like monsters. And I thought that was really kind of cool when you think Mm -hmm. about it, like, like the scene you've got and the scene you talked about, they were going to kill McCready. Right. Just because they suspected him, no other proof. Other than they found, you know, a ripped up shirt or whatever, but they were going to kill him. It's a similar theme I talk about when I talk about the zombies, like Walking yep. Dead, which yeah. is really worse, the monster or the human. Yeah. Who's yeah. worse? Yeah. Look at us. We did our second redux. <laughs> <laughs> I know. And and so do you, last time I think we ended with, do you think Charles or McCready were the thing? Because of all the controversy about whether you could see their breath or whether Child's earring was still in, you know, everyone was like speculating if the, one of them was. Or I not. have always thought that neither of them was. I don't think and they were. Both either. of them were willing to sacrifice themselves to stop it. Oh, well, they had no choice. What are they going to do? For well, you they could have walked a few miles or whatever, <laughs> you know, whatever. But you I see think how both- far that dog ran. <laughs> I think both of them are of the opinion of it doesn't matter if you are or not. I know I'm not. And so I'm not going to let you out of my sight. <laughs> and, and it's, again, it's that mutually assured destruction sort of thing. They yeah. both are. Uh, I, I've always, I've never thought that either one of them was the thing at the end. Yeah. Me either. Yeah. I, I think they're, they're both drinking scotch. But Yeah. It's probably so, the only thing that I mean, I don't know the thing would drink alcohol. <laughs> well, it might, but hopefully not scotch. I'm not a scotch man. Yeah, myself, I'm not a scotch so. person either. Yeah, no, no. no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but we we did our 200th and our second Redux. We did, so and good. we would like to thank everybody out there for indulging us yet Woo! again for uh, our Redux of 1982's John Carpenter's The Thing. If you uh, like what you hear or learned anything from this episode, we would love you to go down and give us a thumbs up on YouTube. You can always comment. We would love to hear from you. If you are listening out there in podcast land, a review would be miraculous for us. If you would do it, especially on Apple or iTunes. Stars, stars help. Stars help more people find yeah, us. Give us yeah. more stars. Star ratings. It doesn't even have to be written. Just rate us. Yes. And um, if you want to see any of our other shows, we have other shows on YouTube as well as some bonus and uh, subscription content on Patreon. Uh, so you can find us. We're all over the place. And until next time, when I think. We're going to be in the land of horror again. You're going to scare me again. Okay. We're going yeah. to uh, cut this one because it's been long. I'll be seeing you, David. See you, too. <laughs> All right. Bye. Bye. Start the car, Johnny has the keys.